This is going to be a very long video. The Nintendo Switch has many many good things about it, and its games are one of them. I would like to talk about my 10 personal favorites in this video. There are only two rules. The first rule is that, if the game is on the Nintendo Switch, it can be on this list. The second rule is that, it has to be a game that I own. So as much as it does pain me to say this, Mario Kart 8 Deluxe and Super Mario 3D All-Stars will sadly not be on this list. But with all that being said, everyone, welcome to this video, my name is MantraPlays, and here are my 10 favorite Nintendo Switch games. I'm sure a lot of you are surprised that Minecraft made its way onto this list, but Minecraft overall is not a bad game. While a lot of people think that it is talked about a little too much, Minecraft overall is still really really fun. The two main modes it offers are survival and creative. I really like both of these modes, I find them both to be really enjoyable. In creative mode, you have the ability to just go wherever you want, you can walk or fly anywhere, and you don't even have to worry about surviving. You have access to Minecraft's huge inventory, and you can just go and build whatever with nobody stopping you except your friends. In this mode, I push my creativity to the limit. I go wherever and I build wherever I want, and it is glorious. This mode actually got me into playing Minecraft a lot more, because I didn't really care about survival that much when I was younger. But now that I've played survival a little more, it is also very rewarding and fun as well. Trying to survive from mobs and building your own shelter and looking for diamonds is incredibly fun, especially for one mode. It can get even more fun if you try to speedrun survival though. That can get really intense. Minecraft has done plenty of crossovers in the past, with the biggest new one being Steve's inclusion in Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. I was incredibly hyped when I watched that reveal trailer. I almost screamed out loud from excitement when I saw Seed break through those blocks. However, my favorite Minecraft crossover is without a doubt the Super Mario mashup pack and texture pack. The world that Mojang built for that pack was incredible to explore. It included so many cool details and easter eggs from the Mario franchise. One of them that I happened to find on my own is that the ground of the Mario Bros. 3 section and the Piranha Plant section forms the shape of a piped Piranha Plant. Minecraft also includes a lot of mini-games, such as Battle, Tumble, and Glide. I found joy in all of these mini-games. They were all really fun to me. Overall, Minecraft is a really decent thing, and while the graphics do get a little old after a while, they lead to a lot of cool inventions, and you should definitely go play it if you haven't already. Mario and Sonic at the Rio 2016 Olympic Games was one of my favorite games on the Wii U. And while this game isn't as good as it, Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games Tokyo 2020 is still a pretty good one. This game did add some pretty interesting and cool things to the series. Some of them are the ability to play online, the ability to play almost every event with either motion controls or just buttons, and a full story mode for at least the home console titles. This game also introduced the 8 and 16-bit events. While these weren't my personal favorites to play, they were still a pretty good addition. My biggest hope for this game was that they would improve the roster, and sadly that didn't happen. They've had the same roster since the 2010 Winter Olympic Games, and that's kinda sad to see. And I'm not counting guest characters here either. But what they did add was 4 more new events. These new events are surfing, skateboarding, sports climbing, and karate. I like all of these new events. I feel like they make a great addition to the already large amount of events in this game. It's also kind of nice that they added them because these events were going to be put in the Tokyo 2020 Olympic Games. However, my favorite events in this game are the new dream events. While there are only three, which is way less than I hoped for, they're still all really decent. Dream Racing is my personal favorite because it feels like you're playing a game of Mario Kart. I also really like the opening cinematic in this game. All the Mario and Sonic games do a good job with the opening, but this one just looks really, really clean. While playing online was pretty fun, it was very difficult to find people because I assume that not a lot of people have bought and played this game. 
but as a whole, Mario & Sonic at the Olympic Games Tokyo 2020 does its job, and it does it pretty well. I enjoyed it. In short, Super Mario Party did a big favor for many of the old Mario Party fans. It went back to the original style of Mario Party, the board style. While I did enjoy the kart style as well, the board style is really really fun. Speaking of boards, there are only four of them which kinda does suck, but they all are very unique. My favorite board is King bob -Omb's Powder Keg Mine. I like the layout and the location, it all just looks really nice. Super Mario Party also offers a nice variety of other modes as well, with my favorite one being River Survival. In this co-op based mode, you have to work very strategically with your partners to paddle down this ginormous river. You can pop balloons to play team minigames to gain time, but sadly these minigames do get very repetitive after a while because it's a very few amount of them. River survival can get pretty intense when you're running low on time, but thankfully that doesn't take away from the fun of it. After you clear a certain path, a branch opens up leading you to two more. You get to decide which one you go on to. This mode contains five different endings, and each path is surprisingly pretty different from one another, even though some of them have similar themes. On the plus side, this mode looks absolutely gorgeous. I love what they did with the visuals here. Soundstage is another new mode, and it's pretty decent. I like the rhythm-based minigames that this one included, and it's really fun to play against friends. Challenge Road is also a neat single-player focus mode, where you play a set of minigames. All of the locations in this mode look really, really nice, and I like the idea of taking each minigame, putting it into a level, and basically forming a new Super Mario Bros. game, but Mario Party based. There are also a lot of new minigames to enjoy, and I do mean a lot. My two favorites are Rumble Fishing and Rattle and Hmm. Rumble Fishing is a game that I never expected I would like, but something about the concept of fishing for dragon eels and pulling out the longest one is just really, really interesting to me. Rattle and Hmm uses the power of the Joy-Con's HD rumble perfectly. It's kind of hard to describe, but you can really feel the difference between each enemy's movement pattern or action, whether it be on land or underwater. The last thing I'll bring up is the character roster. The roster in this game is so good! There are characters such as Goomba, Monty Mole, Boo, Drybones, Pom Pom, and Diddy Kong. Super Mario Party really did bring some fresh and nice things to the table, and it was a step in the right direction. I just wish it had a little more to offer. But besides that, it was still a really fun time. I can hear the hate comments coming in already, and I'm sorry guys, but Fortnite has to be on this list. It just has to. It is not a bad game like everyone thinks it is. A lot of people hate it because it is talked about way too much, and that's how I was before I actually played it, but after I played it for the first time, I actually liked it a lot. For some reason, it is just very thrilling to jump out of a flying bus and skydive down onto an island, then grab some weapons and healing items, and then just go and find each other and eliminate each other, and it's even more fun with friends. Another big complaint that I hear about Fortnite are the updates. Epic Games has to keep on updating the game to stay alive, but a lot of people claim that each update ruins the game because they took out something that they were used to. While I do miss some of the old weapons and some of the older map features, I am always excited to see what Epic Games has in store for the next update. I feel like if fans just went into the new season or update with an open mind, then they would come out of it much happier than they would if they went into it thinking they were going to remove stuff. But enough about the complaints. Let's talk about how groundbreaking Fortnite was. When it was in its prime, it was absolutely revolutionary. It single-handedly changed Twitch, and it is currently in a war with Apple. The reason that Fortnite became this popular is because it is extremely fun to play. I have so much fun playing this game, especially with friends. This game can become so exciting and nerve-wracking, especially when you're in the top 10. Fortnite really shines in the customization department. There is a huge amount of skins in this game. There's also a lot of other equipment that you can equip yourself with just to look as stylish as possible. And of course, you can't forget about the emotes. I mean, a lot of the emotes have become memes at this point. 
You can't really top this. I could go on and on about Fortnite and how big of a game it has become, but we must move on to the next spot on this list. Super Mario Maker was such an amazing experience on the Wii U, and when I saw that its sequel was going to be on the Switch, I was super excited. Before it launched, this was my most anticipated Nintendo Switch game, besides Smash Ultimate of course. And this game, without a single doubt, lived up to the hype. There were so many new features that Nintendo added. Probably the biggest new feature that Nintendo added was the story mode. This was actually a really, really fun thing to go through in 100%. A lot of the levels did a great job of showing off the new level gimmicks that Nintendo added to the game. And surprisingly, the plot wasn't to save Peach, it was actually to rebuild her castle, which is something pretty unique and I'm happy Nintendo did that. Another big feature that Nintendo added was multiplayer. While being available for both local and online was really nice. I enjoyed playing it online a lot more. Multiplayer Versus is such a fun mode. Competing against three other people to race to the finish as fast as possible is such a small and simple idea, but it is super duper fun. In version 2.0 of the game, Nintendo added Ninji Speedruns, which is a pretty fun speedrunning mode. While it did get kind of boring after a while, I enjoyed it when it was pretty popular. And it is still kind of fun to just run against a bunch of ninjas and try to get the fastest time as possible. The final big update that Nintendo added was World Maker, and this is a really interesting mode. You get to basically make your own Mario game that consists up to 40 levels with 8 worlds. On top of that, you can add level themes on the world map, warp pipes that take you from one place to another, and even bonus houses so you can rack up some 1-ups. Nintendo didn't just add new game modes, they added so many new course parts as well. Things like on-off switches, slopes, icicles, the angry sun slash moon, and many many more were added to this game. I really wanted to see more bosses before this game came out, and it took a while but now we have Boom Boom, Pom Pom, Bowser, Bowser Jr, and all seven of the Koopalings. I also really wanted to see some new power-ups, and now we have the cat suit, the boomerang flower, the acorn suit, the power balloon, the frog suit, the Super Mario Bros. 2 mushroom, and even the master sword. Speaking of the cat suit and the boomerang flower, they also added the Super Mario 3D World game style, which is really really cool in my opinion, and it's very very different from the other game styles, which isn't a bad thing. A lot of people don't like that it's so different, but I think it's actually a really good thing. The developers really did work hard to make this a proper sequel, and with all the updates added, it really is deserving of the title too. With all the new features, you can do crazy things like this. I had an absolute blast playing Mario Maker 2 and I really can't wait to see what the third game in the series has to offer. Oh, and uh, Nintendo? Can you please do me a favor? Can you please just add the ice flower? <laughs> Nintendo took a big risk when making Splatoon, and it ended up being so good that they just had to make a sequel for the Switch. At its core, Splatoon 2's gameplay is very similar to Splatoon 1's, but they did add some new noticeable differences. One of them is that if you're using a roller, and then you jump and swing it, you'll do a vertical swing which has more range, but it doesn't cover as much area. Another is that the charger slash snipers let you keep your charge if you go and swim in the ink before you shoot it out. The developers also added two new weapon types. The first one are the dualies. These dual shooters actually let you dodge roll on the ground to help escape from your enemies faster, which is pretty handy. The second new type are the umbrellas. These act like a shotgun, 
and if you hold the button down, they open up acting as a shield. They also added some new sub weapons. My favorite new sub weapon is the torpedo. I like how it locates players and then does small explosions after they hit the ground. All of the specials in this game are also new. My favorites are ink armor, booyah bomb, splashdown, tenta missiles, and the baller. The five main battle modes that Splatoon 2 offers are Turf War, Rainmaker, Clam Blitz, Splat Zones, and Tower Control. Turf War is the mode for regular battles, and the other four are used for ranked battles. My favorite battle mode in this game is Rainmaker. The story mode in this game is also pretty neat. I think it is a nice step up from Splatoon 1. The levels are more unique in my opinion. It's also nice that the Squid Sisters are part of the main cast in the story mode. But if you want a really good story mode, then you should buy the DLC, Octo Expansion. I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but that story mode is absolutely amazing. Especially the final boss. It's also way too difficult. It's also really nice to see the dialogue between Pearl, Marina, and Captain Cuttlefish in that story mode. Salmon Run is also another amazing mode. In this 4 player co-op mode, you have to take down three waves of enemies. It can also get really intense, but that just makes it more fun. But when I say intense, I really do mean it. I mean, just look at this. But besides the difficulty, this mode can get really, really rewarding if you do well. But it's sad that it's only available at certain time periods. Another thing to note is the weapon selection as a whole. There are so many weapons in this game. Just look at them. Splatoon 2 is definitely the best multiplayer game on this list. Besides one that we'll get to later. Since the release of Super Mario Sunshine back in 2002, there hasn't really been a proper 3D sandbox style Mario game until 2017 when Super Mario Odyssey came out. Mario Odyssey definitely did please many of the fans of the series, and it also pleased me very, very much. I loved playing this game when it came out. It was so much fun. It felt like a brand new and fresh experience, and that was so magical to me, especially after finishing Galaxy right before this game came out. To this day, I still go back to Odyssey every once in a while and just run and jump around the kingdoms. I have no idea why I do it, but for some reason, it is just so enjoyable to me. It's probably because of Mario's movement capabilities in this game. One unique thing that Odyssey brings to the table is Cappy. With Cappy, you can capture enemies. That means you get to take over them and possess them, which sounds a little creepy at first, but it can lead to some really, really cool things. In the final boss, you capture this one specific character, and my mind was blown when I saw this happen. The kingdoms in Mario Odyssey are also a huge joy to roam around. While some of the kingdoms do stick with the normal type of levels like the grass, beach, forest, snow, and desert themes, you have some very unique locations as well. Some examples of these are the Cap Kingdom acting as somewhat of a purgatory level, the Luncheon Kingdom revolving around food, the Lost Kingdom being somewhat of a poisonous jungle, and of course, the Metro Kingdom acting as New York City. And even though some of the worlds do have normal themes, they all manage to feel really different and unique from each other, which is a really nice thing. The world building in this game is also really, really good. You can jump off of a skyscraper. That's just one of the many incredible things that you can do with the worlds in this game. Mario Odyssey also features an incredible amount of costumes to dress Mario up in. All of the costumes are different and unique, even though some of them do have similar themes. Some costumes even reference older games. For an example, you can play as Builder Mario from Mario Maker and Dr. Mario from Dr. Mario. Mario Odyssey does a really good job with these references. As an example, you can play a level 1-1 from the original Super Mario Bros. Speaking of, the 2D segments in this game are also a really nice break from the 3D segments. Some of them are very unique as well. Mario Odyssey also features some minigames that you can compete in as well. One of these includes driving an RC car around a miniature Mario Kart course. Another one includes competing in a beach volleyball tournament. And that one. Oh boy. 
getting 100 rallies is surprisingly extremely difficult. If Nintendo ever makes Mario Odyssey 2, that is the thing that does not at all need to return. However, my favorite side mode in this game is the Koopa freerunning. For some reason, I really like speedrunning this mode. Watching the world records and trying to imitate them and go for the best time as possible is really fun for some reason. A few months after Odyssey's launch, Nintendo added another mode called Luigi's Balloon World. I actually like this mode a lot too. I like going around and trying to find other people's balloons. And this mode can also give you a lot of coins, which is useful for buying costumes and more moons. However, in my opinion, Mario Odyssey has two major flaws. The first one that I hear a lot is that there are too many moons in this game, which I kind of agree with. I say kind of because I actually liked hunting for all the moons in this game, but it did get a little repetitive after a while. My second problem with this game isn't as big as a problem, but I wish that the Ruined and Cloud Kingdom were a little more expanded on. They're just like boss levels, with a few stuff to do afterwards, but that's it. But with all that being said, Mario Odyssey was still a great return to form for the Mario franchise, and it is definitely, without a doubt, a game that every Nintendo Switch owner should have. We're finally here, Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. This really is the Ultimate Smash Bros. And where do we even begin? I guess we'll start off with everyone is here. Daddy Sakurai, <coughs> Masahiro Sakurai, is literally the god of game development. He has brought back every single Super Smash Bros. character ever into Ultimate, which is still an insane thing to think about to this day. The roster for this game is absolutely ginormous, with even more characters to come on the way by the time this video is being recorded. There are so many great franchises being represented here, such as the Mario franchise, Zelda franchise, Kirby, Pokemon, Metroid, Kid Icarus, Fire Emblem, Xenoblade, and more. There are so many third-party franchises represented as well, such as Sonic the Hedgehog, Metal Gear Solid, Mega Man, Pac-Man, Street Fighter, Final Fantasy, Persona, Dragon Quest, and even Minecraft. The stage selection is also really impressive as well. There are over 100 stages, not including Battlefield and Omega forms. All the characters fit right in with the new game engine and new game mechanics, and it just feels super good. Ultimate's gameplay is amazing. When you do a strong attack on someone, it really feels like you packed a punch. However, Ultimate has so much more to offer. While a lot of people complain about the adventure mode and how it's too long and repetitive, I actually really liked it. World of Light was a lot of fun to me. Even though it did get kind of repetitive at some times, it was still a joy to play through, especially the boss battles. While I do wish there were more cutscenes like in Brawl Subspace Emissary, it was still a really nice time. And the map is absolutely massive. Just look at it. And speaking of World of Light, the idea of spirits was actually really, really cool to me. Bringing all these video game characters actually made me learn a lot more about video games than I thought. Masahiro Sakurai does know a lot. Overall, I think that spirits is a really interesting and unique smash mode, and I liked it. It was also really cool to see what Sakurai ranked as the strongest spirit when they were all leveled up at the max level. Classic mode was also a very cool experience. I enjoyed going through each character's specific route and seeing how unique each one was. All 8 bosses, if you count Master Hand and Crazy Hand as different bosses, were all very fun to take on. I enjoyed every single one of them. And the credit segment in Ultimate is also really really cool. But Ultimate still has so much more to offer. There's Training Mode, All-Star Mode, Sentry Smash, Cruel Smash, Home Run Contest, Stage Builder, Video Editor, and even more. All of these modes have been improved to the maximum level, and it is really nice to see them return. And I haven't even brought up the music. Ultimate's soundtrack is absolutely outstanding, with original pieces and remixes of older ones. I personally love Ultimate's new remixes. Some of my favorites are Delfino Plaza, Breath of the Wild main theme, Brinstar Depths, Fire Emblem Three Houses main theme, Beneath the Mask, Arms Grand Prix official theme song, Helen Slash Delarna, and, of course, Gangplank Galeon. Ultimate really does deliver with all of its modes and its incredible gameplay. 
But sadly, there is one thing that I do not like about it. The online. The connection issues aren't exactly Sakurai's fault because Nintendo chooses to do their online this way. But quick play is where the online falls apart. While the preferred rules issue never bothered me because I like playing with and without items and I don't care how many people are in the match, a lot of people are disturbed by the preferred rules option. However, the thing that did bother me when playing online was getting into Elite Smash. Getting into Elite Smash is such a chore. It is so difficult for no reason, and I still haven't gotten into Elite Smash. It is so frustrating. The fact that I had to switch over to battle arenas and online tournaments to enjoy online is not a good thing whatsoever. Another not really bad but hilariously disturbing thing is shared content. I mean, just look at this. But in the end, Super Smash Bros. Ultimate is still an incredible time. There's not really a feeling like just being able to whip out some controllers and play a match against a couple of friends. It is really fun and exciting. And Masahiro Sakurai, I tip my hat off to you, my good sir. You did some amazing work here. This game literally came out of nowhere, and it's still crazy to think that a crossover between Mario and the Rabbids from Rayman is actually a really decent game. I adore Mario plus Rabbids Kingdom Battle. Before this game came out, a lot of people were worried that the Rabbids would ruin this game, and I can say that that's 100% false. In fact, I think that the Rabbids make this game. They give so much personality to all of the characters, and they are absolutely hilarious, along with Beepo. Beepo is a robot created by a girl who is a big fan of Mario games. I'm not going to go too much into the story because I want you to experience it for yourself, but basically the rabbits teleport into the girl's room and steal one of her inventions and then they go and corrupt the Mushroom Kingdom with it. Beepo teams up with Mario, Rabbit Peach, and Rabbit Luigi to go help fix the world and find all their other friends. And this game is one huge adventure that contains so many funny moments and hidden details. Let's start off with the world. Mario Rabbit's Kingdom Battle has four worlds, and while that may seem like a small amount, each world is massive, containing its own unique environments. World 1 starts off with your typical grassy area, but then it transitions to a beach, and then a jungle, and then an incredibly tall toy tower. World 2 starts off between a mixture of sand and snow, and then it eventually becomes an oasis, and then you travel through a sandstorm and you end up in a glacier. World 3 starts off with a spooky town, and then it transitions to a harbor overgrown with vegetation, and then a swamp, and then finally you end up in a graveyard. World 4 starts off with a normal lava area, but then it transitions to a mine, and then a mechanical factory, and then it just goes back to lava. All four of the worlds in this game are brimming with life, and they each have their own little hidden details to see. They all each have their own challenging puzzles as well, Especially that pipe puzzle in World 4. Oh my, that one was troublesome. The battle system in Mario Rabbids is also really fun. I never had a bad moment with the battle system. I always enjoyed myself. Even if the battles in this game can get really difficult, I actually enjoyed the difficulty in this game. There was never a frustrating moment. I always felt like it was my fault because I didn't plan out my strategies well. The progression of upgrading your characters was also really really good, I felt like the pacing was perfect. Buying weapons with coins and upgrading the skill tree with power orbs was really cool. You could feel the difference in gameplay and power after you did a big upgrade. The combat in this game is absolutely amazing. But there's just one more thing I need to say. Quickly watch Luigi. That's right. Luigi dabs in this game. Ubisoft, you're amazing. All of the bosses in this game are also really incredible. Especially the World 3 boss. I mean, just look at Phantom. Fear, 
Why screaming, Mamma Mia? Who leaves me gray and grim? Oh, what does Peach see in him? Mario! With great joy in my heart, it's time I watch Mario Kart. You're first and doing so well, but you are gone the Spanish shell. <laughs> And now you and your rabbi friends have finally met your end. Just let me catch my breath, then I'll arrive, see you today. The last thing I'll bring up is the music. Mario and Rabbit's Kingdom Battle was composed by Grant Kirkhope, and he did an absolutely amazing job with the music. The soundtrack is phenomenal. Surprisingly, my favorite pieces of music in this game are every single one of the boss themes. So yeah, if you don't have Mario Rabbids right now, go get it. It is an amazing game and you should definitely try it. Don't worry that the Rabbids are going to ruin the game because they really don't. Alright, here we go. We're almost at number one. But before we get there, I want to share with you guys some honorable mentions quickly. Animal Crossing New Horizons and Luigi's Mansion 3 are both really, really good games, but Luigi's Mansion 3 Online and Animal Crossing as a whole did get a little boring after a while, and after beating Luigi's Mansion 3, I really had no reason to go back to it. Captain Toad Treasure Tracker was really fun and solid, but that's just it. Same goes for Kirby Star Allies. Rocket League can be very fun on specific occasions. Super Mario 35 was really fun, but I don't really consider it as an actual game, it just feels like more of a demo for Switch Online. Alright, now to the last honorable mention. And I know I'm gonna get a lot of hate for this, but please just hear me out. Breath of the Wild. Now don't get me wrong, Breath of the Wild is absolutely outstanding. The world in that game is absolutely ginormous, and I feel like I've said that word 15,000 times in this video already. The fact that you can go wherever you want and do whatever you want is really, really impressive, and it definitely redefined the Zelda franchise. But, it wasn't really for me. I did beat the game and I did enjoy it a lot, but I felt like there was too much to do, and also it was too difficult at some times. I started playing Breath of the Wild during a hurricane, and after the hurricane ended, I didn't go back to it after a year and a half. And the only reason I went back to it is so that I could prove that I had finished the game. And while going back to it was still quite a bit of fun, I didn't like it as much as I thought I would. Don't get me wrong, it was still a blast, but the game that's number one on this list is so much better in my opinion. Speaking of... Alright, number one, my favorite Nintendo Switch game. I actually couldn't decide which game was better, so there's going to be two games in this one spot. I know this might seem like cheating, but this is my list. So anyways, here they are. Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition, and Xenoblade Chronicles 2. It's kind of funny how both Xenoblade games fell in the top spot on my list, but what can you do? These games are just amazing. Not amazing. Outstanding. Besides the Xenoblade fans, I'm sure a lot of you did not expect this to be the number one spot on this list. But just hear me out. Let me explain why these games are my favorite Nintendo Switch games, and probably the best games on Switch. So please keep watching while I talk about both of these fantastic games. I think we can all agree that the first half of 2020 was a really dry time for Nintendo. The only two big games we got were Animal Crossing New Horizons and Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition. And I was just so bored and desperate for a new game in that time period that I just had to try out Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition and it did not disappoint without a doubt. 
the story in this game is absolutely nuts. When I was watching the plot twists unfold, my jaw literally dropped. The story starts off with two ginormous titans, the Bionis and the Mechonis, fighting. After their long battle finishes, eons pass. We transition into Sword Valley, where the descendants of the two titans are fighting once more. After you watch Dunban, who wields the divine sword known as the Monado, take out a bunch of enemies, the camera zooms out and you get a big view of only a few of the major landmarks that you see in this game. And then the scene ends with a clean shot of the Bionis and the Mechonis, and then the logo. One year later, you meet a boy named Shulk, who you probably know from Smash, and his best friend Ryan. They take you to Colony 9, the place where the Homs, the people of the Bionis, live. Then you learn more about the Monado and what happens if someone tries to use it. Soon after that, Shulk's home gets invaded by the Mechon, the descendants of the Mechonis. In an attempt to fight back, Shulk picks up the Monado and charges towards the Mechon. The Monado gave him a vision of what would happen if he tried to avoid a projectile in a certain way. He used this to his advantage and evaded the attack. His buddies Dunban and Ryan joined up with him afterwards. After taking down a bunch of Mechon, something terrible happens in their home. Shulk and Ryan forge a plan to go find and take down every single Mechon. This is just the beginning of a huge adventure that's going to 100% make you regret that you missed out on this. In your adventure, you meet so many more amazingly lovable characters, and experience so many more sad, funny, and amazingly epic moments. This is a very long journey. All the cutscenes put together are around 10 hours of cutscenes. And while that does sound like a lot, it's because it actually is. This game is long. But, after you beat it, you will feel incredibly emotional, happy, and satisfied. And in the end, it is all totally worth it. And while the story does start out slow, it does that for a purpose just to get you ready for the big and intense moments that you'll experience later on. I'd say when reaching Air of the Sea is when the story starts to become really good. The worlds in this game, like Mario Rabbids, are also really ginormous. Places like Sotrol Marsh, Aerith Sea, Magna Forest, and Valak Mountain are all huge. But that's a good thing because these worlds are filled with secrets and hidden details to find. The combat in this game is also really good. It relies on a set of auto attacks and after waiting for a while for your arts to charge up, you can use stronger attacks. Doing auto attacks lets you initiate your talent art. Each character comes with their own sets of normal arts and talent art. They are all really unique especially the ether-based ones like Melia and Ricky. Performing attacks lets you fill up the party gauge. There are three segments of the party gauge. If one of them is full, you can revive a fallen party member. However, if all three segments of the party gauge are full, then you can initiate a chain attack. During a chain attack, time stops and each character can release a set of their own particular arts. If you do this well enough, then you'll get a second or maybe even a third, fourth, or fifth round at this. My best performed chain attack dealt 326,000 damage to the enemy. Those are just the basics to what the combat is like in this game. In Definitive Edition, Nintendo and Monolith Soft remastered some of the music. And I'm actually glad they did this because the music sounds so much better in this game than it did in the original. Music tracks such as A Tragic Decision, Engage the Enemy, and An Obstacle in Our Path really did improve from the new remastered music. The last thing I'll bring up before we switch over to Xenoblade 2 is the voice acting. Xenoblade 1's voice acting is phenomenal, especially Shulk's. Just listen to him. <laughs> Talk all you want, because those words will be your last! <laughs> Done! Xenoblade Chronicles is an incredible RPG, and you must experience it for yourself if you haven't already. Play it before you play Xenoblade 2, because trust me, you will get so much more out of Xenoblade 2 if you played this one first. I'm gonna quickly just throw in what beat him up said at the end of his review on this game. I highly recommend giving Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition a chance. It's not only one of the best games on Switch, it's one of the greatest games of all time.
Just like in the first game in the series, the story of Xenoblade Chronicles 2 is absolutely mind-blowing. It contains so many good characters, and I'm not even joking, I have not found a single bad character in this game yet. Each one of the party members go through some serious character development, and that's because the writing in this game is so good. I have not seen anything that surpasses the writing of Xenoblade Chronicles 2. The story in this game is made perfectly. The worlds in this game are actually very different than the ones in the first game. While most of the creatures that you roam on are titans, they aren't as big as the Bionis and the Mechonis. So, each one is considered their own nation. Since the story is laid out this way, that means that every titan slash nation knows about each other, and this set up the political structure in a perfect way. I'll show you a scene of how the politics work in this game. My deepest thanks to you for agreeing to this ceasefire, Queen Rakura, Emperor Nile. As I recall from the Assyrian Treaty of 350 years ago, the Praetorium was to refrain from intervention in times of war. And yet here you are intervening. But I trust you have a suitable justification, Your Eminence. Naturally. But first, to ensure impartiality in these negotiations, may I present Nira Nira, acting chairman of the Argentum Trade Guild. Furthermore, representing the Tantalese, His Highness the Crown Prince Ozikyrus Brunev Tantal will also be attending. The Crown Prince, the Prodigal Prince of Tantal. <laughs> This scene was at the very beginning of chapter 6 in the game, and this helps show you how the politics really are in this game, and how the world is really set up. The politics help show you how each nation is settled, and what makes Pyra so special as the being she is, and Aegis, the Master Blade. The way people live in Xenoblade Chronicles 2 is dependent on two factors, drivers and blades. Of course, you could just live a normal life, but if you want to make some extra cash and become an overall hero, you should become a driver. In order to resonate with a blade, drivers have to resonate with the core crystal, the thing that holds the blade's life in it. If they are successful, then they can obtain the blade. Blades are life forms who grant specific powers to their driver through their weapons, and their own bodies. The story starts off by focusing on a salvager named Rex. He lives on a small titan he calls Gramps. One day, when trading artifacts that he sells for cash in the Argentan Trade Guild, he gets an offer for a job from the chairman of the guild. It's through this job that he meets the special blade known as Pyra, the Aegis. The Aegis is the most powerful blade in the world, and she demands a request from Rex. She wants him to bring her to Elysium, a place atop the world tree, which is the center of the world. While I'm not going to go into too much detail from here because I want you to experience it for yourself, the story in this game is absolutely amazing, and I honestly think it is better than the first games. It contains so many beautiful and epic moments, and I actually almost cried during one of the scenes. You know the one, the beginning of chapter 7. The story ranges to around 14 hours of cutscenes. 14 hours! That's longer than 6 Star Wars movies combined. And you'd think that such a long story could get a bit tiring after a while, but no, because it keeps on throwing new things at your way. The story is also paired with some decent voice acting. While it's not as good as the originals, I still feel like the people that did a good job did a really good job. Examples of this are Malos and Pyra. The story can also be very comedic at times. An example of this is this scene. That's a heavy burden you have there. Sure you're up to it, pipsqueak? See sets step aside and let the big boys take charge. Come on! Yield the merchandise! Huh? What? Van Damme. Do you know this guy? Never seen him in my life. Bah! <gasps> Wait. Are you... <laughs> uh... You really are a bunch of rinky-dink, bogus, stupid, no-mark drivers, aren't you? Behold the mighty Zeke! Von Gembu! Bringer of Chaos! 
mostly known as Zeke, and often addressed as the Zekanator. There is more to this scene, but I'll just show you the ending. Uh, listen, whatever. She'll be mine soon enough. Got a problem with that? Then come at me, and don't hold back. What? Is this guy for real? The combat in this game is very different from Xenoblade 1's, but I actually like it a lot more. It's a lot more complicated because of the blade and driver mechanic, but it's a lot more fun as well. It still revolves around auto attacks, but this time you have to be stationary in order to perform an auto attack. And while that may seem bad, if you know the speedrunning tricks, it's not that big of a deal. Arts work in the same way as before, and performing blade specials is kind of like a talent art. Each blade comes with their own specific elements, like fire, water, ice, wind, electric, stone, and more. When you use a blade special, it activates an elemental combo. This sets up the elemental route. An example of an elemental route would be fire, fire, light, or fire, water, fire, or fire, water, ice. After successfully pulling off the elemental combo, you'll activate an elemental orb on the enemy. Elemental orbs can be broken through chain attacks. This time, if you break an elemental orb in a chain attack, you can extend the chain attack. Those are just the basics on how the battle system works, and I enjoy it a lot more than the first game. Xenoblade Chronicles 2 also features an incredible DLC, which is Torn of the Golden Country. It's basically a prequel to the game, but it is so good that it was actually released as its own game, which is really cool in my opinion. Before we end this too long video already, I want to quickly talk about the music in this game. Oh my gosh, Xenoblade Chronicles 2 has literally the best music I have ever heard in a video game. The composers did an absolutely outstanding job with the soundtrack. There are so many good music tracks, such as Counter Attack, Incoming, Battle, Over the Sinful Entreaty, The Decision, The Impending Crisis, Pass from Far Distance, The Awakening, A Faint Hope, Walking with You, Desolation, The Tomorrow with You, Parting, Drifting Soul, Gorma, Temperantia, Disappearing World, Tantel, Fonset Village, Archen, Torgoth, Fountain Mima, Our Eternal Land. <gasps> we are the Chosen Ones, so move forward, Exploration, Battle in the Skies Above, You will recall our names, Monster Surprise You, Deathmatch of Torn, The Power of Jin, Predator of Malthus, After Despair and Hope, Ophion, More Ardain, Roaming the Waste. I'll leave the link to all of those songs in the description. You need to go listen to at least a few of them. They're all so, so good. But anyway, wrapping things up, the Xenoblade Chronicles franchise is absolutely outstanding, and if you have not played it, what are you doing, you silly goose? Go play it right now. It is something that you will never regret touching at all. It is absolutely 100% worth your time. Trust me on this one. If there's anything you need to do right now, is to go play this game. Don't make the simple and dumb excuse of saying, Oh, it's anime! I don't like it! I don't want to play it! Just because it's in the anime art style and has a few anime stereotypes, does not mean it isn't bad. In fact, that is far from the truth. I mean, just look at Poppy. How may I be of service, Master? Oh, 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 oh. Wait a minute! Forget you see that! Tora must change the settings! <clears throat> okay, that was a bad example, but still, this game is so good. It is too good to ignore. I don't know how it isn't as popular as something like Zelda. It's a crime that Xenoblade Definitive Edition wasn't nominated for Best Game of the Year. Not even Best RPG. We need to give this series the credit and recognition it deserves. I've already told a bunch of my friends about this game, and they've played it as well, and they loved it as much as I did and you need to do the same. Go play it, beat it, and then tell your friends about it. This series needs to become more popular. Because of this series, Rex and Pyra have become my number one most requested characters for Smash Ultimate. That's how much of an impression it made on me. It's Rex and Pyra and... 
Wallowee. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. If you liked it, make sure to hit that subscribe button and smash that like button. It would do me a big favor. But you know what would do me a bigger favor? If you went and go played Xenoblade right now, go play one of them. One or two. Maybe even X. I mean, I haven't played X, but go play one of them. Trust me, you will not regret it. Just go play it. In my opinion, it is the best Switch- No, I'm just kidding. It's not my opinion. This is actual facts. This is objective fact-based that it's the best Switch game. I mean, you know what? Go play it. Just don't forget to play it. Go play it. Yeah, go play it. Go play it. Go play it. Go play it. Play it. Play it. Play it. Play it.